You look like you're having a good time. We're having a good time up here. Jane is going to solve all of our problems, which is really good. I must say, however, the market is up today. Thank God it's been up for three days, but it has a way to go. It's been an unexciting beginning of the year. Uh, and those of us who are depending on all of our savings uh, get a little nervous about this at any rate. Uh, we have somebody here who is really, really, really knowledgeable about the whole idea of what to do with your money now so that you can actually not live in poverty 20 years from now or 10 years from now or whatever it is. I personally plan to be around for 20 more years, but <clears throat> who knows? I have already outlived all four of my grandparents, so there's, uh, that's hedging the bets. But nevertheless, uh, we, are, we have Jane Bryant Quinn. You must have seen or heard of her somewhere because she's, she's a prize-winning authority on personal finance articles, books, broadcasts, and columns. She and I used to be in the green room at CBS when we would do the CBS morning news. I was the consumer reporter, and she would come in to do the serious personal finance stuff. And um, that was a while ago. <laughs> at any rate, she is the best-selling author uh, of many wonderful books. Um, her Making the Most of Your Money was considered the best personal finance book on the market by none other than Consumers Union, which is a pretty good source. Um, the current book, How to Make Your Money Last. What a title. <laughs> it's a great title and certainly compelling to people like me. Uh, we have, as I said, 20 books. I think we've sold a few of them already. But if you, at the end, we will have, uh, David Andelman will be at the table. He will take your $20 bills or your credit cards. And you can buy a book, and Jane will, Jane will sign them there at the end of her talk. Um, and again, $20, the, the retail price is $28. So we're giving you a deal. This has been published to rave reviews. You know, Jane was back at Newsweek in the beginning when women were uh, not writers, right? You had to kind of get coffee for the writers. They were all men. Mm. Mailed us. Mailed us. Yeah. Uh, she's been at News at Women's Day, Good Housekeeping, many other publications. She's been a co-host of a PBS investment series as well as a regular commentator for, as I mentioned, CBS News. And... Um, you know, she's just a wonderful person, extremely knowledgeable, and I think we're going, all going to get to learn a lot. So let me get off the podium and let Jane talk to us. Thank you, Betsy. It's so nice to see so so many old friends here today. And this, that's really the reason why Betsy thought maybe I wasn't even here, because I kept hanging out with, with people I've known for a long time and haven't seen for a long time. So it was a great time. Sorry I gave you nervous reaction, but you knew I was going to be here. And I thank you for inviting me. It's really a special pleasure to, always a special pleasure to be speaking to fellow journalists. It's a huge challenge because I know that everything I say will be Googled and checked, probably on the spot even before the Q&A. So I was very, very careful. I'm sure you're glad that we are going to be talking about money instead of politics. <laughs> Hillary Clinton's emails, Donald Trump's insults. I'm sure you know why voting is called suffrage, because we have to suffer through these primaries. I watched all the debates, both parties, and I think Lily Tomlin got it right when she said, no matter how cynical you are, you cannot keep up. But I raise this because I don't want to, you to let these political cage fights influence your financial decisions. The American economy is not on the brink of collapse, no matter what you hear from some of the candidates. From the macro level, consumers have been leading the economy up. Job numbers, hourly earnings, real disposable incomes 
up. The U.S. economy is growing at a moderate pace, but it is growing. Price inflation is nowhere in sight. Pache, all those people who have been expecting high inflation for the past 10 years. Household debt is considerably down, and consumer sentiment is high. Now, I do wish the stock market had been a little kinder to us earlier in the year. I have no idea whether it was a minor dip uh, based on the strong dollar and the slowdown of energy and export businesses, or whether it forecasts a new recession. And none of the pundits who issue pundity opinions know either. And during the next investigation by the Senate Hindsight Committee, some of the pundits will be wrong and some of them will be right. But we have all, all been through this before, time and time again, and we have all survived it. The political arguments this year are not connected to traditional business cycles, as uh, Bill Clinton's uh, mantra was, it's the economy, stupid, just fix it. Uh, it's deeper than that this time. It's the emotional issues of racism and of unfairness. And you see it in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the growing cultural revulsion felt by evangelical voters, three decades of stagnant wages for the working class and the middle class, and a worsening economic inequality. It is not clear that the wealth gap by itself leads to a financial shock. Inequality has gotten worse in this country even as the economy has recovered from its uh, bottom in 2009. But Inequality has produced a political shock, which is why we have Bernie Sanders and so many Republican radicals on the right. Now, which party wins will clearly have broad social effects as well as effects on the wealth gap. But from a macro point of view, normal business cycles pretty much run along in a traditional way related to consumer spending and business profits regardless of who the president is. Whatever is happening at the moment always seems like it's brand new and it's scary and we won't get through it this time, and that is never true. For your financial lives and mine, the basic principles apply even in a testy election year, save money, get out of debt, manage your spending, uh, invest for the long term. Everything else is theater, just theater. Now I wrote my new book because I was thinking about the long term. We are all getting older, I am sorry to mention. Uh, my head began popping with questions about this life phase we call retirement, especially as we face the very long lives we are likely to live. None of us knows how many years we have ahead. 20, 30, more? In April, my family will celebrate my mother's 101st birthday. She is sharp and happy, and three years ago, she married a lovely young man of 87. <laughs> And it's a love match. They hold hands and look into each other's eyes and he writes her poems. So you, very good sonnets, by the way. So you never know. Now, centenarians, like my mother, are rare, but our long life expectancies at this point should not come to us as a surprise. We can all read the numbers. On average, people who reach 65 are going to live until their mid to late 80s. That's true of men as well as women, um, on average. People in the upper half of the income range, as I am sure you have read recently, who have had good educations and health insurance all of their working lives, are living even longer than that. The 90-plus uh, population has tripled over the past three decades. So the question of how long your money will last is a pretty big one, which is indeed why I picked it for the title of the book. It is not improbable that even professionals like us with good salaries and growing savings could run out of money in our older age. It's not the bag lady syndrome, but it's pretty close. Now, many of us in this room are working well past traditional retirement age for the fun of it, as well as for the money, and that helps. And there is always Uber, of course. 
25% uh, of Uber drivers are now 50 and up, according to the company. But if you work, you want it to be a choice. You don't want it to be a necessity. Now, the way you look at your finances changes as you move from pre-retirement to post-retirement. When you're working, you focus on accumulating a financial pot. Uh, maybe you have a dollar target in mind, maybe you don't, but you are always thinking, I want more, I want more, saving whatever you can, maybe not saving enough, but that's all that's in your mind, building up that pot. You're paying down debt, I hope, and focusing on stock investments for the long term. Now, this state of mind flips as soon as you retire, when your paycheck stops. Suddenly, you look at that pot and you say, this isn't a pot, this has to be an income stream. How much can I afford to take from that pot without running out of money? And how do you figure that when you don't know how long you're going to live or if you're married, how long your spouse is going to live? Now, for me personally, asking these questions as I was doing all of the research for this book resulted in some changes the way my husband and I are managing our finances. We thought about uh, our future choices, which choices we might have to make, and more importantly, when we might have to make them. There is nothing like putting real numbers on the table to get your mind around how you're going to live. And if you're married, your spouse should be at the table too, so that both of you know what your options are and agree on them. Now, many of you have done the numbers, uh, will do the numbers, and you know you're going to be just fine. That's very good to know and very comforting. Uh, alternatively, if it appears that your retirement income might fall short in your later age, and it might, uh, you need to have some kind of a plan for saving more or dipping into your savings to pay the bills. And depending on the size and type of investments you have, there is a specific amount you can probably afford to take without running out of money, and I will say something more about that in a few minutes. But first I'd like to talk about one piece of the planning that everybody needs to do, whether uh, already retired or not, and that's what I call it's right-sizing your life. When you think about the future, you tend to say to yourself, how much money am I going to need, which is exactly backwards. Uh, instead, you should ask, how much income will I have? And put your expenses, uh, under, develop your expenses to fit. Once you know how much you have, then uh, income you will have, then you can proceed very well. Now, I raise this in particular if you're married. Uh, you have to create three different versions of this kind of budget. How how much you're going to have in the future. First, assuming you both live to a late age. Second, assuming that the breadwinner dies first and early. And third, assuming that the other partner dies first and early. Uh, and because, of course, when one of you dies, you'll lose one of your two social security checks, maybe you'll lose a pension check. I find that almost no married couples plans for how a surviving spouse will live after the first spouse dies. You sit down and do your planning and you always assume it's for the two of you. And believe me, I hear about it from surviving spouses. Usually it's a she and she's usually pretty scared because it never occurred to them to develop a budget for her after the breadwinner retired and she has no plan in place for dealing with it. Now, spouse protection is always high on my list regardless of gender. Uh, I have just a couple of points here, and one is for pensions, those of you who still have one coming, as you know you can get a large check for your life only and a smaller check if you cover your spouse. Um, often a couple will agree on the larger check because they're just retiring and so they're worried about money, they don't know how it's going to work out yet, the larger check looks better. And then uh, a few years later, they are really sorry they made that decision because they, they find out they're okay and it leaves the spouse dependent on 
a dependent spouse in very deep trouble if uh, the pension holder dies first and the dependent spouse is left alone. So think about spouse protection in any kind of uh, financial arrangements you make. And second, your IRAs, bank accounts, brokerage accounts. When you opened them, you signed a beneficiary form. That might have been years and years ago. And the beneficiary form trumps your will. So if you've been divorced and you remarried and your ex's name is still in the form, your ex will get the money. And the same is true with IRAs, banks, and brokerage accounts too. Your ex will remember you very fondly. Your current spouse will not. This has been tested again and again in the courts. Uh, whoever is on the form gets the money. And conversely, a retirement account that you have with an employer, uh, such as a 401k, that goes to your current spouse automatically, uh, all of it, even if you've been married just one hour. If you want part of these savings to go to your children, as often happens in marriages at a later age, uh, your spouse has to sign the form saying that he or she agrees. And here is a, a personal story about that. I remarried six years ago after having been widowed. And I had an account of that sort that I wanted to go to my kids. And suddenly in the night, I imagine, this is the sort of thing that, that financial reporters tend to imagine. I imagine saying, I do, stepping into the wedding tent, tripping over a chair, breaking my neck, and disinheriting my kids. So this is going to sound crazy to you, and it probably was. One of our friends is a notary public. He was coming to the wedding, and right after the ID, my dear new husband, Carl, sat down and signed the forms. <laughs> I know that's very anal, but you take my point. <laughs> A very quick word about Social Security. Many of you have made this decision already. Some of you have not. I'm sure you know that it's generally better to take Social Security later rather than earlier because the longer you wait, the larger your benefit will be. I'm just saying one word about the change that Congress has just made in Social Security last year, which reduces the total amount that many married couples can receive, but not everybody. And I'm guessing that many of you in this room are still okay. You can collect. Formerly, there was a way of collecting a spouse benefit, and at 70, your own higher benefit too. It's a double dip. You got both benefits. Uh, but for and that is still true for anyone 62 or older la as of last year. Even if you haven't filed for benefits yet, you are still qualified for this double dip. A lot of the Social Security offices, if you call them up, will say, no, it's all over, you're finished. It is, that is not true. The information is not up on Social Security's website yet because they've got to get all the legal and regs and everything all set. And a lot of people are getting very confused. But if you were 62 or older last year, you still can get this double dip. If you are younger, uh, you can't get both anymore. Now, fond as I am of investments guaranteed to last for life, such as Social Security, uh, there is one I am not fond of. It, many of you may own it. It is called a deferred variable annuity with living benefits guaranteed, blah, 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 and a few more words. And you are often approached by financial advisors when you're in your 50s and 60s, and then really heavily when you're in your 70s. It's a product they love to sell. It comes with a prospectus this thick, which you will never read, and the salesperson is probably never read either. Now here's the concept. You put up some money today to be invested in the annuities mutual funds. In 10 or 15 years, you start getting payments in the form of an income for life. You are guaranteed a minimum of perhaps 5% of a number the insurance company calls your basic benefit. For a definition, look on page 102 of the prospectus. You hope that because you were invested partly in a stock owning mutual funds, you will get a payout higher than the 5% guarantee. It is sold, and you are dreaming of, a potential gain with no risk of loss. 
Now, the book explains these annuities in full. Here I have just three things to say. When you buy this thing, you are paying a commission of 5 to 7%, sometimes 10% of the money you put in, which is why they get pushed so hard. Uh, you're facing uh, what's called the Doppler effect, which is the tendency of stupid ideas to seem smarter when they come at you rapidly. <laughs> That's the sales process for these deferred variable annuities. You pay high fees, typically 3.5% a year. And because of these costs, you are highly unlikely to get anything more than the minimum guarantee. Now, the minimum guarantee sounds 5%. That still sounds okay, right? But you are not earning 5% on the investment, which is what many people think and is sometimes promoted. The insurance company has guaranteed only to give you your own money back in 5% increments including any gain you may have earned over that 10 or 15 years. So you have to be very, very long-lived before your own money runs out and the insurance company actually starts, has to start paying you with its own funds. There are better ways of guaranteeing uh, future income than that. Now, if you have such an annuity and you have not started lifetime payments yet, there is a way of stripping out your own money without breaking the contract and still and then forcing the insurance company to start paying you 5% of your of your benefit uh, with its own money so all is not lost you can still you can still retrieve something out of these contracts and it's on in the book on page 145 for those of you <laughs> who want to do that there's an even worse version of this so-called investment known as a fixed indexed annuity which is apparently linked to stock market performance, but isn't really, and it isn't fixed, and it isn't indexed. So it's just another version of the all gain, no loss sales pitch that will not produce the results you imagine. And yet it is a very often bought by people in the 60s and 70s uh, who have a substantial amount of money in their IRAs or uh, other savings. Uh, one more product that I want to mention to you that might not be producing what you think, and that is a universal life insurance policy or indexed life insurance policy. Um, many of you had term insurance when you were younger and don't have insur life insurance anymore because you don't need it. Those of you who still have these cash value policies, these universal policies, uh, please understand that they might very well not last for life. It's a life insurance policy that you thought would take you all the way, but it does not necessarily do that. If the investments in the policy are not doing as well as the salesperson projected when you bought this policy, uh, your policy is going to eventually blow up, leaving you with no insurance and also, incidentally, a big tax bill. Financial planners are running into this more and more and more. Now, once a year, you get a report from your insurance company, uh, Universal. At the bottom of the first or maybe the last page, you will see a disclosure telling you how long your life insurance policy will last, assuming no change in the premiums you're paying or the fees or the investment returns. And if you're 65 and the company tells you your policy will last for 20 years, it will blow up when you are 85. And you can do something about this now. When you're 80, it will be very hard to do something about it. To, to do something about it, you have to increase the premiums you pay, or you have to restructure the policy right now in some ways. And hardly anyone knows that a universal policy or an indexed universal policy is not guaranteed for life and might blow up. But now you know, so if you're in that group, please look at these uh, reports you're getting. So uh, I'm going to move off some of this stuff that I think is deceptive and go to something more sensible, main, namely managing your retirement savings, stocks, bonds, and cash. 
Before I start making pronouncements on this subject, I do want to remind you of an ad that appeared in the Financial Times. It said, the Clairvoyant Society of Greater London will not meet next Tuesday because of unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> the future is always unknowable, but I am a big believer in financial research and I always write and think with that research in mind. So when managing your money or working with an advisor who is managing it for you, there are I think, four principles. Number one, if you have enough money so that you know for sure you can live off your interests and dividends, uh, you have won the game. You don't have to invest for risk if you don't want to. You might want to, but it is not necessary that you enter that. So if you look at your finances and know you're rich enough so that you have won the game, you can invest in stocks, you can not invest in stocks, you can do what you want. Uh, it, many people who have won the game think that it is necessary to invest in stocks because they want to leave more for their kids. That's fine, but you don't have to. Um, second, in your 60s, say, you are going to live another 20 or 30 years. You are a long-term investor, just as you were a long-term investor when you were 40. Uh, some people approaching retirement think, oh, I'm older now, I need more income investments, I need CDs, I need bonds, I need more dividend-paying stocks. But with dividend stocks, if that's what you're focusing on, you are not diversified. You don't own the big growth stocks that propel the market averages. And you take a real punch when your sector of the market goes down. That's always the risk of not being diversified. As an example, consider the financial stocks. They were huge dividend payers in uh, 2006, 2007, and then you know what happened to them all in 2008, and most of them haven't recovered yet. Uh, lately, we've been seeing the same thing with the big oil and gas companies. Uh, looking mainly at dividend companies creates higher risk and limits your long-term total return. And as for bonds, bond funds, they are fine if you're looking at a five to seven year horizon, say the early part of your retirement. But what about the rest of your life? Over 15, 20, 25 years, the U.S economy is going to grow, the global economy is going to grow, profits are going to grow, stock prices will grow. They always do. To worry about what the stock market was doing last week or this week or tomorrow is just fruitless for anyone who is investing for the long term, which should include Betsy, <laughs> as well as all the rest of us. Now, sometimes there's a downdraft in stocks, but so what? You've gone through this over and over and over. The broad stock market has always recovered and gone higher. You need stock investments to help maintain your standard of living during the second half of your retirement 10 plus years from now. How long does it take for stocks to come back after they've reached a peak and, and gone into a bear market? I asked a top investment manager to figure this out for me. Uh, peak to peak, from stocks are at a peak, they go down, they go back to the point where they started. Uh, the average return to, to get back to get your money back effectively is 29 months. Now, long-term investors can manage their way through 29 months. The longest time it took was a little over five years, and that was 2000 to 2006, which is the one most recently in our mind, which is one of the things that makes people worry about stocks. The shortest was in June 1998, five months. So, but although the stock market always comes back, individual stocks might not. Some stocks beat the market, some stocks uh, fall behind, some stocks go to zero. So a portfolio of individual stocks is much riskier than the market as a whole. You cannot count on this financial research saying you're 20, 29 months average to get your money back or, or the longest or the window from five months to uh, five years that you cannot count on that working when you own individual stocks. You, uh, 
if you are picking stocks yourself or if your financial advisor is. Now, all the research done on long-term market performance that you read about every day uh, uses indexes to, as a proxy. S&P index as a proxy for stocks uh, and intermediate treasuries as a proxy for bonds to feel comfortable that you will get the kind of results that the research shows, your best investment would be a broadly based stock owning mutual fund, in particular, an index fund. Now, I don't expect all of you to switch to index funds, but I want to tell you something about them anyway. Most of you have your, have your investment plans already set, but there's still something you need to know if you want to change things. First, what an index fund is, I'm probably all know it, but I have to say it, uh, follows the market as a whole. So if Standard & Poor's index rises 5% and you have an S&P index fund, it will rise 5% uh, minus costs. Decades of research show that over time, low-cost index funds do better than mutual funds run by professional managers who try to beat the market. This is absolutely set in stone. That's how it is. And if these professional managers are not beating the market over time, I'm almost certain that buyers of individual stocks, like you, like many, are not beating the market either. When you own individual stocks, you remember your winners, every single winner you ever had. You forget your losers. You never average the two of them together. Consequently, you have absolutely no idea how your investments have performed compared with the market as a whole. If you did know, I think you would be surprised at how much money you left on the table. Now, don't mistake me, picking stocks can be a great hobby, like bicycling or jigsaw puzzles or sport fishing, but the important money that will keep your family secure for 30 years will actually do better over time in index funds. And the index funds most widely recommended today are called total market funds. They contain the stocks of both large and small companies, which of course is total diversification. And just FYI, the lowest cost total market funds are run one by Fidelity, which charges one-tenth of 1% 1 a year. And the other one by Vanguard, which costs half that, 0.05% a year. And you can't get your money managed for much less than that. I put my money is I, where uh, my mouth, my money where my mouth is, whatever I'm saying. And uh, I've been an investor in index funds for almost 40 years. I will tell you how I happened to become one. I was had working on my Washington Post column at the time, and I got a phone call from a guy who says, my name is Jack Bogle, I'd like to come and see you. And uh, I said, about what? And he gave me the index fund wrap and how it does better than managed funds. And I said, well, I was very skeptical. And I said, well, send me what you have to say. I read it. I, I still thought there was obviously, it had to be hindsight. It had to be picking numbers from the past. So anyway, I had lunch with Jack. And all I remember about that lunch is that there were tables spread all over the table. There were all kinds of pieces of paper with numbers on them and whatnot. And so I listened and I went back and I thought about it some more. And I um, called him back and I said, you know, I think you're right. And he made a convert of me at that time prior to uh, having uh, individual retail index funds available. The only way you could invest was either with individual stocks or with managed mutual funds. And so, I mean, that was how we all got started. That was what we did. But all of a sudden there was this revolution and I am delighted that Jack came to me with his numbers. I am also an index investor for bonds, by the way, specifically government bond funds, which will probably surprise you because they are paying zilch. Um, individual investors usually ignore these funds. Instead, you buy high yield bond funds, also known as junk bond funds, for their higher interest income. But 
you know, of course, that these funds invest in the bonds of low-quality companies, which leads to two problems. First, when business turns bad, some of the bonds in these funds default. They don't pay. Or they will be downgraded and lose some of their value. Studies have shown that the losses from defaulted and downgraded junk bonds exceeds the extra interest you earn from the high yields over time. So the average investor in high yield funds is not actually receiving the yield that he or she expected when you invested. And that is a surprise to many people. And second, when the stock market falls, the price of a high yield bond fund falls too, as has been happening now. For a really bad example, in 2008, uh, when the S&P fell 37%, the, the junk junk bonds that pay the highest yield fell 50 to 60%. So those bonds were hurting you rather than helping you. By contrast, government bond funds rise in price when stocks have a sharp decline. We've seen that over the past month. Uh, we saw it hugely in 2007, 2008. So owning government funds gives you protection when stocks go really bad. And surprisingly, again, given what I've just told you about the uh, high yield bond funds, government funds do as well or better than junk funds over the long run while taking fewer risks along the way. I've seen a lot of research there and I have to say it surprised me as I'm sure it surprises you. Now what we worry about most of course is whether our savings are gonna last as long as we do. How much can you take out of a nest egg every year without running out of money in older age? And a tremendous amount of research has been done on this subject too. Uh, especially over the past 10 years because of the retirement of the boomer generation. 10,000 people a day are reaching 65 and a lot of people are worrying about them. I talked to all the key players who are involved in this kind of research for the book. The classic safe number, as I'm sure you all have heard, is 4%. Take 4% of the value of your financial savings, stocks, bonds, CDs, whatever, financial savings, not real estate, financial. And in the first year, you draw the money out. And in each subsequent year, you take the, the same dollars plus an increase for inflation, if there is any. Your money will last 30 years. And in almost all cases, it will last much longer. Uh, the 4% rule would have carried you through the Great Depression. It would have carried you through the great stagflation of the late 60s and 1970s, which was actually the worst time for retired people. It has only been 16 years since the tech stock crash of 2000, but so far the 4% rule is working fine. Now, if your investments are well diversified, meaning that you own smaller stock funds as well as large stock funds, for example, in a total market index fund, you can safely start with a 4.5% withdrawal plus inflation increases every year. And again, this strategy would have worked during the worst 30-year periods in our history. But that is pretty conservative. And I ask, is it really worth it to create a financial plan uh, that will aimed solely at getting you through a period, a 30-year period that includes a depression or a hyperinflation. 98% uh, of the time, 30-year uh, periods are much better than that. So do you prepare for just the two worst or do you prepare for the better ones? And if you are flexible in your spending, meaning that you can reduce your withdrawals, if stocks go badly for two or three years, you can start with 5.5%. And in fact, a bit more, I see a hand raised, but I'm almost finished. Let's do it with the Q&A. <laughs> uh, in other words, there are recipes. You can look at the options, consider your circumstances, and make a well-informed choice. One important point for these withdrawal choices to succeed, you have to have at least some of your retirement money in stock-owning mutual funds. You can't say, I'm scared and I'm doing only bonds and CDs. Uh, the minimum to make 
any of these withdrawal plans work is uh, about 35% of your total financial nest egg in stocks and the rest in bonds. And the maximum is about 70% in stocks with the rest in bonds. And regard, regarding asset allocation, all the research, again, assumes that you keep your allocation between spot, stocks and bonds at a steady state for life. For example, if you start out 50-50 stocks and bonds, you keep it there. You don't uh, reduce your stocks and increase your bonds as you get older. If you do that, if you reduce your stocks, your total return is going to drop. Uh, a surprising new approach being proposed by financial planners is that uh, you reduce your stock holdings somewhat as retirement approaches because that is your day of maximum risk if the market crashes the day you retire. And then you actually increase your stock allocation during your early retirement years. And I've looked at a lot of the data on that and I thought it was pretty interesting and actually I switched to it. So I'm your guinea pig. Oh, so far I'm fine, we'll see. I should reiterate, by the way, that all this research was done using the broadest stock and bond market indexes. It obviously can't be done on portfolios of individual stocks because you don't know how they're going to turn out. Uh, it also means conceptually, not that you would do it, but you might, conceptually it means that you could make your money last for at least 30 years by owning just two mutual funds. Uh, total market U.S. stock fund and a total market U.S. bond fund. I mean, that's a surprising solution. You probably don't want to do that. You can add other types of investments if you want to, but the point is you don't, don't have to. Other investments are essentially decoration. A very quick word about long-term care insurance, should you own it or not. It is expensive, as you know, and most companies keep raising their premiums on existing shareholders, sometimes by 30 or 40 percent. If you're single, I don't see the point of having a long-term care policy. If you enter a nursing home, uh, you will use your own savings and investments to pay your bills. And if you run out of money, uh, Medicaid steps in. I have some experience with that because that's what happened with my mother-in-law, my late mother-in-law. But if you're married and need care, you have to consider what would happen to the well spouse at home. And here I'll tell you another personal story. Uh, my late husband was quite a bit older than I, was, I am. And when long-term care policies first started coming out, they were terrible policies. You just couldn't count on them to pay for anything. It was crazy. So we didn't get one. And then they got better. And at that point, his health was poor. And so he, we couldn't get a long-term care policy for him. And then he had a really bad couple of last years. And I was able to take care of him at home happily. Cost $100,000 a year. And it would have cost about the same if he had been in a nursing home. So uh, then, fast forward a little bit, and I started dating Carl, and he thought maybe we should get married. And I said, do you have long-term care insurance? <laughs> and he didn't, and I said, that's a deal breaker. Been there, done that. <laughs> so fortunately, he qualified for long-term care insurance, so now we both have it and we got married. <laughs> so if you are still working and can get it at a group rate through a company, I think it's a very good deal. If you're buying individually, there are ways of reducing the cost, but of course you have to pass a health exam to get it, so uh, the older you are, the harder it is to get it. Uh, when comparing policies, find out how the companies have treated their existing policyholders. Have premium increases been low? Have they been high? High is not good. At the moment, I know of only three companies that have never raised premiums on existing long-term care policy holders, Mass Mutual, New York Life, and Northwestern Mutual. Uh, not to say that that won't happen in the future, but that's the current state of play. And finally, you have to plan 
not only a financial transition to retirement and to later retirement, but an emotional transition as well. And I think that's the really hard one. You're moving away from the high status of earner and into the role of engaged citizen retired. And such a sharp change takes some getting used to, as those of you who go have gone through it know. A friend of mine recently told me it took him a year. We are being replaced by younger people whose world it is going to be. That's how it works. Uh, but still, we have 20 or 30 years to go. What are we going to do with them? A voluntary retirement usually starts out fine, I'm free, I'm free, but after a few months or weeks, you start saying free to do what? And it is very typical for a depression to set in for a while. There is only so much golf anyone can play, I think, or so many TV series you can binge watch. You have always known about the need to plan for retirement financially, but what comes as a surprise to many is the urgent need to plan for another life. And in a way, this is where we stood many years ago when we first got out of college and there was a bare field in front of us and we didn't know who we were going to become or what we were going to do. And then we figured it out and we invented ourselves piece by piece. And at retirement, you are facing another open field. Again, we have to invent this time reinvent a life that is productive and engaged. You need to step into retirement with at least something on your calendar and you have something for a while, but as later retirement comes, you have to get something else on your calendar. The faster you can bury the old workplace you and discover the, the liberated you, the more satisfying retirement is going to be. I had a friend, now dead, who held a very high editorial position in this city. Many of you would know his name if I said it. After a couple of years of retirement, he decamped to San Francisco. And he said that New York was for players. And when he wasn't a player anymore, he had to get out of town. Now, in my view, he succeeded at work, but he failed at retirement. That's a cautionary tale, but we have been forewarned. Personally, I am terrified about this coming retirement if I retire, but I don't want to live in San Francisco, so I will figure it out. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Don't, don't go away. Don't go away. Okay. Lots of... Uh, we have run over our time limit. Oh, dear. We, we really have. But, but I have a question. I, I, you've I got a, about three questions. Okay, I have an okay, objection. I think we'll this, take, is an ob this is an objection, I think. An obje so. We'll <laughs> take three questions, and then I've got a couple of remarks, and, and okay. then we'll go. Over here. Alan. Hi. Hi. Um, simple, complicated question. What should people do about investing in the energy sector right now? Considering all the oil companies that are going to go bankrupt, all the frackers, should you buy Exxon or what? Well, now that is, you, we've used up one question that I cannot answer because I have no idea what is going to happen to these companies or when. Uh, in general, you know, assuming a return to the mean, I, you know, when stocks are low, uh, I don't think Exxon is going to go out of business. Uh, so probably if I were a buyer of individual stocks, I would consider it, knowing it might go lower, but saying, it's worth it. But always remember, this is this thing about how well have you actually performed. Because will Exxon, if it stays low for a while, the way the bank stocks did after the uh, crash in 2008, I mean, some of them aren't back to where they were and their dividends are still down. If that happens, how does it affect your total portfolio? And will it put a drag on it over a period of time? You cannot tell when you're buying individual stocks. And so, might you buy it now? Sure, why not? But, but will it necessarily improve your long-term portfolio? I cannot tell. People still hanging on to Citibank, hoping it'll come back. That was, what, 10 years ago? Hi, I've got the mic yep. here. Hi, uh, Jerry Eskenazi. Um, question for you. You've spoken to a lot of groups. How do we rate in terms of 
those of us in this business rate in terms of what we know or what we, do we have more concerns than others? Do we do better than others? Do you have some thoughts about that? I, I had, well, we, we, unfortunately I spoke too long apparently and so we haven't had much time for a q and I, I would be very surprised if you were better or worse than other groups that <laughs> I speak to. <laughs> I would be very surprised. One more. Yep. Uh, Bert Shannon, what advice would you give us, uh, someone that has to take their RMDs during a down market and um, has to live on the RMDs as part of their 4%? Um, when you uh, re required minimum deposits at 70 and a half and you you, and you have to live on them for that period of time. Uh, actually, your initial RMD, as I'm sure you know, is less than 4%. So, but if you want, are working on the, this 4% type schedule, you can, and if you, you don't necessarily have to take the whole RMD once you're over what the government requires. If you are over and you don't need all the money, I see a lot of people saving part of that. It depends on whether you need every dime yeah, but out if of, you do out need of your it. RMD. If you do need it, you spend it, and then you get your next RMD. And you <laughs> need, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure how complicated that is. But you, you, but you can plan what you are going to, this is a question of predicting, projecting what your income is going to be, social security, pension, if you have one, RMDs, projecting it, and then saying, that's how much money I'm going to have. Can I pay my bills for the next 20 or 25 years? And that's a lifestyle question as opposed to a financial mm -hmm. question. And the sooner you know, if you can't, the better off you are. I have to wait. I'm have sorry. To. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, 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 no. Actually, We're Jane is going to stay. She's going to sign books, sign books over in that corner. But don't run out just yet. When you do run out, by the way, we want your name tags over there on the table in that corner. Uh, we, one other thing, Jane, we give our speakers and membership in the oh, Silurians. Yeah. You are now a member Thank for a year. You. Please, please come back. Real meaty talk, lots of good information. I'm really glad I bought the book. And it's over there. David Andelman, get over there. He's, he's over here. He's got to get over there to take your money uh, by credit card or, as I said, $20 for the book that costs $28 anywhere else. Next meeting. This is good. This is good. The spring is going to be really good. Brooklyn District Attorney Ken Thompson will be here with us. He is a man on the front lines uh, trying to improve police community relations. He has already started innovative programs that are being copied nationwide. He is a major, major figure. And he will be with us in March and on Wednesday, April 20th. Famed political biographer, winner of two Pulitzer Prizes, three National Book Critic Circle Awards, man who knows Robert Moses and Lyndon Johnson like no other, Robert Caro will be here. It's going to be a good spring. So you get your finances in order. Go over and uh, Jane will sign your book. And uh, we will see you next month.